I always come prepared in case someone isn't here to teach. So, and I'm always about three lessons ahead of what I teach, but I sure would have liked to have went over it before I got up here. <laughs> We're going to be looking at Revelations chapter 10. I was going to try to get 11 in there, but uh, that didn't, that's not going to happen. But we're looking at the, the kingdoms of this earth becoming the Lord's kingdoms. But there's a lot in Revelation chapter 10 if you, if you study it. If you read over it, it's just, you know, it's just a short chapter in the, in the books of the Bible. In Isaiah chapter 60, verse 12, it says, For the nations and kingdoms that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. The glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee, the fir trees and the pine trees and the box together to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet glorious. The sons also of them that afflict thee shall come bending unto thee, and all they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet, and they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. I don't know what you think about that passage, but I get excited just thinking about the Lord being in charge. You know, every every time I get up here and teach, I tell you, I'm sick of it. I'm ready to go home. It, I'm over all this. And I'm, I'm tired of the crime. I'm tired of the, the, the evil that's in this world. And even the people that claim that they're righteous, they're evil. They lie to you. It's, it's a constant lie. In Zephaniah chapter 3, 8, it says, Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all the fierce angers for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. That is another, you just can't, you can't imagine this world being ruled righteously instead of the way it's ruled right now. I pray for my children, my grandchildren. I pray for my neighbor's children. I pray for, for all the children in this church that God keeps a hedge of protection around all of them. And I pray for our pastor, and I pray, I pray every one of you in this church, I speak your family's name out, and I say, Lord, help them, protect them, keep them safe, help their lost loved ones to come to Christ. And I don't do it because I'm a good guy, because if you've been around me long enough, like my wife has, you know I ain't a good guy. <laughs> I'm just concerned about where our church is going and where it's heading. The name of this lesson is The Little Book and the Seven Cryptic Thunders. In Revelation chapter 10, verse 1 and 2, it says, but before, let's, let's, let's ask the Lord to help us. Our dear, precious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for being so good to me and my, my church. Thank you, Lord, for being so good to our pastor. And Lord, I pray for our church, and I pray in these last days, in these perilous times that we're living in, that, Lord, that you'll stay with us and that you'll protect us and keep us safe until you come. Lord, we rejoice at the day of the Lord when it comes and you take over this wicked and sinful world and set it right. 
We pray, Lord, that you'll help us to have power in the Holy Spirit and not our, our power, or not our righteousness, but your righteousness. Lord, because we don't have any righteousness. Lord, we love you and we thank you for, for being so good to us. Help us to learn today. Help our eyes and our ears to be open. For I ask in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Revelation chapter 10, verse 1, it says, And I saw another angel, another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as the pillar of fire. He had in his hand a little book opened, open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. Now this is the, the, the angel of the Lord. This description that they're giving is not a description of every angel in heaven. This is a description of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's clothed with a cloud. You go into the book of Moses, the, uh, the first five books, and every time God is described, he's in a cloud. And it's a cloud. I mean, this is not just a, a rainy cloud. This is a cloud of smoke because our God is a consuming fire. When he went down on Mount Sinai, it burnt the top of that mountain. And wherever he goes... His fierce righteousness precedes him. He's a mighty angel, a mighty God. Amen. His head, it says his, his face was as it were the sun. And I've, I've taught a lot about this. Whenever you see the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not going to be some little faint light or He's not, when you look on him, it's not going to be like looking at me. It's going to be like looking at the sun and his brightness. You can't look at it. It's too bright. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, it says, And the Lord went before them in the day as a pillar of a cloud and led them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by night, or by day and, and night. The Lord is a consuming fire. There's nothing about him that's not glorious. It's not like any of us. He's righteous. And when you go to heaven, it's not going to be going up there and going... No, you're going to go flat on your face and you're going to be pronated before God and you're going to say, you're going to... It's going to be, it's going to be a terrifying moment. In verse 2 it says, He set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. Now I believe what he's doing here is he's... It's like someone who's moving in. And he's taking possession of the earth and he's t putting his right foot in the sea and his foot up on the land. Now, somebody might overlook that and say, well, that's just, you know, that's, that's what you would do if you were God and you're taking possession of the earth. But I think what God is doing here, he's demonstrating that he's putting his foot in the sea because one of the strongholds of Satan is in the sea. One of the other strongholds that Satan has is in the earth. If you read Exodus chapter 20, it tells you that there's three, three places that God, uh, God tells you not to worship. In the air, under the sea, and under the earth. So he's putting, he's coming from the air. Satan had, or by this time, Satan's already been cast down to the earth. So God is demonstrating that he's taking charge, taking control 
of everything, every aspect. And all these demons are scared to death, believe me. One thing that, you know, when you do some studying and you start looking at all this uh, stuff that's coming upon this earth, one thing they all say is that when you speak the name of Jesus, these things scr scream and sc scurry off because there's power in that name. And we're, it's getting worse every day. When the Antichrist comes up out of the sea, he comes up out of the sea. It's not a group of people out there, and he's not going to come out of the, I, I don't believe he's coming out of the, the European Union or anything. When the Bible says he's coming out of the sea, he's coming about up out of the sea. When he, he says the false prophet comes up out of the earth, they're coming up out of the earth. There are things under your feet that are coming up. Don't let anyone say, well, you know, the Bible's a spiritual book, so you've got to spiritualize all this. No, you don't. The more I learn about this book, it's a literal book. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the sea. So here we're, we're demonst he's demonstrating that he's going to take control of all this stuff. And like I said, I didn't get a chance to go over this lesson to two or three times. I just found out I was teaching. So forgive me. I, don't, I want to do this justice. Chapter 9 It says, we saw, we saw the Lord opening up the pit and these demonic avatars coming out. And, you know, that's one thing about this, this new world order. They're all about avatars. Have you seen that? I mean, it's just, it, it's more on the news all the time. They want to shut you up. They want to close you off. They want you to be in your house with a phone in your face maneuvering your avatar instead of going out there and doing something and you know it's terrible I didn't start texting until just a, maybe right after I retired because I didn't I want to talk people I want to talk to people but now I find myself texting a lot more than I'm calling and I don't like it I like I, I talk to brother Keith all the time and and it's enjoyable to set her, get a conversation going about the Lord and about what he's doing in our in our lives because the the world wants to shut you up the devil wants you to hide he doesn't want you to interact with people and people are are getting more and more secluded in revelation chapter 13 verse 1 it says and I stood upon the sands of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the names of blasphemy. Nothing good comes up out of the sea. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of this, the earth, and he had his two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon so these things are going to come up out of the sea but and after that after they come up out of the sea God's going to come down put his foot in the sea put it on the land and say it's it's time to evict the devil and his angels and set up his glorious kingdom in righteousness and the whole world will probably be upset about it because people that make it through the tribulation make it through the 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 judgment of the sheep and the goats their offsprings are going to be born just like people are today 
They're not going to be righteous. They're not going to have a glorified body. The only one that has a glorified body is the, is the Lord Jesus Christ's bride. Everyone else will be given a, a normal body. But with, you know, with the, with the Jews, it'll probably be without sin. But only the body of Christ is given a body like his glorious body. No one else. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 says, And I heard a voice in heaven. Now, now is come salvation and strength in the kingdoms of our God and the power of Christ for the accusers of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. You know, when you look at these, when you look at the revelations, God will take you, he'll take you through some chapters and he'll explain the sequence of events. Then he'll go back for the next, like the next five chapters is explaining what happens in between all that. So there's, there's ongoing events constantly through the book of Revelations. It's not just a, you know, you don't go through it and get a trumpet blown. Okay, that's that's over with. Now let's wait a few months, and here comes another one. But there's all there's stuff going on all the time. It's going to be a, a time when you don't really want to be here. The Bible says the face of our God is like the sun, and I've taught on this before too, but I'll touch on it again. When you look at the the creation message in Genesis chapter 1, it lays out a pattern of events that takes place each day. Those events correspond to the next 6,000 years of human history. When you get to the fourth day is, the, is when the sun is created. That sun is created on the fourth day, but also the moon. When you go through history and you look at where Jesus Christ died on the cross, I believe that that was exactly 4,000 years in human history. You say, well, it's 4,030. But I believe time started when Adam and Eve sinned. When Adam and Eve sinned, that's when the time clock started because they were eternal beings up until that point when they sinned, and that's when the, their, their lives began. So I believe that they were 30 years old when Satan deceived them into sinning against God and rebelling against God. I don't think it was just overnight, but I think that's how it happened. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died in the fullness of time. 4,000 years. So what else came around 4,000 years? The church. The moon is a reflection of the sun to the earth for the night. When you look at when you look at the um, when you look at the uh, moon, that's a picture of the earth of the church, and we are to be reflections of the sun. Because when the when Jesus Christ was here, we didn't need a reflection. But he says that we'll be a light to the world. And that light is, the, is like the moon. And we reflect. How many phases does the moon have? It has eight phases. What's the last phase? It's a waning crescent. That's where we're at right now. That's why there's no one preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're just a we're just a little tiny crescent of the moon. You ever seen that little sliver of moon right before it goes through another cycle? I get calls all the time, you know, people say, "Well, I've never seen the moon like that." And I said, "Well, if you go to your map, you can see how it's supposed to look." You know, it you can see the moon like that sometimes, you know. It looks like it's 
an up, upside down crescent moon. When you work midnights, you see a lot of that. You know, on 9-11, they, I, I was looking at the, the moon and it was a crescent and it had that little star like the, the Muslims, uh, Muslims star. You never heard that in the news, did you? That's very rare, but when it happens, the, the, the Arabs look at it as, as, as like uh, as it means good luck. But that's, the moon is, is not the, the Muslims. It's a picture of the church. And the closer we get to the Lord Jesus Christ's return, we're out of here. Because what's the next phase of the moon after that? After the church is removed, it's a new moon. There's no light. And that's what the book of Revelation kind of reiterates all the time. The moon was darkened. There's no moon. Or the moon was turned to blood. Or the moon was, but the moon didn't give off its light. The sun didn't give off its light. It's total darkness. And that's where, that's where Revelation takes us. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, and I think that's pretty neat, 4-4. Four, 4,000 four. 4, years. Christ was born 4,004 B.C. But it says, And when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. In John chapter 9, verse 5, it says, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now we're the light. The light shined brightly right after the, the, the crucifixion of Christ. People were excited. People were willing to die for Christ. The gospel went and was preached throughout the world. It turned the world upside down. People hated Christians, but more people were being saved. I remember that, that, that one story, that's not part of my lesson, but that one story of this Roman legion of soldiers. The leader got led to the Lord. And this, this uh, centurion, he led all the rest of the, his troops to the Lord. And the emperor of Rome decided he was going to make an example of him. So he killed, he says, if you don't repent, I'm going to kill one-sixth. And at the time, the number of a legion was 6,666 men. So they killed 10% of that, 666. They still wouldn't repent and turn away from Christ. So they got the next, he says, well, okay, then the next 10%. And finally he got down to the last 666 men left. And they still wouldn't deny Christ. They were willing to die for Christ. They were willing to give up everything for Christ. What are we willing to give up? I talk about this every once in a while, but I write a lot of letters. And I explain the Bible to people. And because there's no one out there teaching anything. And a lot of people go in a certain direction and they think this is the way it is. And, you know, I correct them. I say, well, no, you got to look at this passage over here. Because you don't, when you study the Bible, it's not just one uh, verse of scriptures. The Bible will take you all over the book. It's all intertwined. It's all intermixed. It's like that. And, and when you get into it, you go, nobody in the world could have wrote this book except God. And even the numbers. And we talked about, you know, the, the next part of the chapter 10 talks about this little book. And, of course, that little book was described in chapter 5. It was sealed, but now this book is not sealed. And he brings this book down, and this is a deed to the earth. And I believe it's 
this book right here. Because this book explains everything in detail. And if you look at your back of your, your King James 1611 book, you, got, you should have seven seals on the back side of it because they knew that that was important. Now, the new Bibles didn't have that until recently when they found out, oh, wait a minute, we better change that so that you might find seven on the back of a NIV Bible. But, but uh, God sealed that book, and he sealed it on the pretension that one day he's coming back and he's taking control of this earth. So everything is written in this book. And this book was before the foundations of the world. So it's, this is an amazing book. This is the hardest book to get into. It's the hardest one to study. But it's worth it. When you look at, uh, I, I talked about Jeremiah chapter 32 when I was studying chapter 5. And everything is just coordinated so perfectly. And we've, we found that the names in the book, as they're listed, tells the story of redemption and the story that God is going to take possession of this earth once again. Jeremiah uh, was the first one, means Jehovah will rise. Hamanel, God has favored and no one favored is favored any more than the Lord Jesus Christ. And you, about, you better be thankful for that because if God didn't favor Jesus Christ, our salvation would be, but thank God that Jesus Christ is God. So we don't have to worry. Our, our salvation is sure. Shulman means recompense of reward. It means that he pays the price to reconcile us back to God. And then it goes on, and, and you get down to uh, the last, last one, which is uh, Benjamin. And that's where Jesus Christ, or Manassas, it, um, Manassai means refuge of Jehovah. And where's our refuge? In Jesus Christ. The seven-sealed book, and who is worthy to open the book? There's only one, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 5, 1 says, And I saw in his right hand him that sat upon the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. This book that you're holding in your hand and a lot of churches don't even take a book to church anymore. they got a big screen up here that puts whatever version they want to put up there. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't trust any other version than the King James Bible. Amen. When I read these other versions and see what they say, it makes me sick. And there's so many people out there that, that trust these new Bibles that have no idea what the real book says. You know, they say, well, go back to the Greek and the Hebrew. You can't learn anything that's any better than this book. The Hebrew and the Greek really don't help you a lot. Now, it helps me in, in translating names and finding what, you know, what those names mean. And there's a whole new study right there. I mean, you can go through the Bible. and I've done it, and I've listed all of them. And it, it, it's amazing that all those, those uh, genealogy of Jesus Christ tells a story of redemption all the way down to the church. The, the book's amazing. But as far as, far as the Bible's concerned, as far as you want to go, as deep as you want to go, God will take you there. There's only one condition to any of this. Is when... In, and you'll see me, I'll, I'll go up and say, guess what I learned, you know, I'll tell you what I learned, or usually vent on uh, Keith over here. And I'm going to show you what I, I've learned. And when I tell him, it reinforces it up here and in here. So the next time, God builds on that. 
and then you accumulate knowledge by doing that. If you hide it all to yourself and say, well, I'm not going to tell anyone because that's my own little secret. You know, that's what uh, psyopses do. Uh, the government's real good at psyopses, and I've been writing a lot about psyopses this week. But a psyops is a, a psychological operation where the government will give certain people certain information because they found out a long time ago. They took a group of prisoners and they put them in a prison and they said, okay, we're going we're gonna to test this. So they, gave, they went up to, to this, these two right here and said, I got some truth for you. And they said, what kind of truth you got? Well, nobody else knows this, but, but I'll tell you. And they found that by giving him a certain amount of truth, so-called truth, that wasn't truth at all, it was kind of outlandish, but they made it believable. Those two prisoners were happy because they believed in their heart that they had something that no one else had. So they were content. So now the government has been using that on American people for years, giving them all kinds of information that's not true, that'll never be true, but the people are content because they think they have something that other people don't. And if you want to know what some of that information is, I'll, I'll let you know. Remember, remember uh, the best example I use is Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon was a pretty good man. He got quite a bit of votes after uh, Johnson. But they wanted to destroy Nixon. So they set him up. They set him up and they, they let him know that the Democratic Party had some papers that linked them to the Communist Party. So then came Watergate. They went in, they went in secretly and to try to steal this information to link the Democratic Party to the Communist Party. And Nixon bid on it. These guys got caught, and then all of a sudden he was a crook. Now, who are the Democratic Party linked to? Why is everything so messed up? So you have to take whatever the government tells you with a grain of salt because we get sucked in and then they use that, that, that psyops to manipulate the public and the way they think. Exactly. And that's how we've been manipulated for years. We look at the Bible. I got the better book. I know I have the better book, but these other people say, well, I've got a better book. It's more perfect. And then they have to revamp it again several years later. So well, now it's more perfect. How can you, how can you, you can't improve on perfection. But you've got to be careful about what you're listening to and who you're listening to. A lot of people believe in flat earth. A lot of people believe that if you don't believe the way I do, because I got this information only, I, I, I did my studies, but the only problem is they, they study someone else's study. And I get a lot of that. And I say, that's a psyops. And they go, oh, no, no, that's not. Oh, yes, it is. I even heard an FBI agent that's retired, had nothing to lose, divulge that information, but nobody wants to hear it because I have information no one else has and I'm so special. But if you don't believe the way I do, 
then you're not saved because you don't believe the Bible the way I believe it. See, that's the, that's the problem. This book is our outline. This book directs us. And if you don't go with the book, and I mean you've got to study this book, because this, just like Dr. Ruckman said, this book is a trap. It's got traps everywhere. You have to study to show thyself approved. A workman need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You have to divide it. When you go through Revelations, you have to divide it. I know Revelations not for the most of it's not for the Christians, but it is for the Christians. Because this is how you learn to rightly divide the word of truth. And when you study Revelations, you have to study the whole entire Bible because there, it's all linked together. It's all intertwined. It's the most amazing book I've ever read. And I keep reading it and reading it and reading it, and I still keep gaining. Now, two days. Let me show you something. In John chapter 4, Jesus Christ goes to the woman at the well. She is a Samaritan. She has a she has a problem, and her problem is sin. She's part Jew, part Gentile. She's a perfect picture of the church. When you go through John, you find this typology all the time. And when you study this typology, it helps you to understand where the Bible goes. And it, it, it's, a, it's a consistent pattern through the Bible. When you, when you study uh, Genesis to, to, uh, to Ruth, it takes you all the way to the end, and then it goes into the kingdom, Samuel. Ruth is a type of the church. But when you look at this woman, she hears what Jesus has to say, and he tells her a little bit about herself, and she believes that he's the prophet, the son of, or prophet. And then she goes running into the city and tells everyone in the city. And then when you get to, to uh, uh, verse uh, 43, it says, Now after two days he departed hence and went into Galilee. But before he went, all the people received him because of what? Because they heard his words. They received his words. He didn't do one miracle in Samaria, did he? And here we are in this church age. Has God done any miracles? He saved my soul. And my faith is in him. And I put my trust in him. And, but there's no miracles. We don't need miracles. We don't trust in signs. We trust in the word. But when you, he comes out after two days, that 2,000 year period, so to speak, a type, he goes into back to Galilee. And there they received him. When he was there the last time, they didn't want anything to do with him. They kicked him out. But he comes back. They receive him because of all the miracles that he did in Jerusalem. You see that pattern? So here Jesus Christ is about ready to come back. And we're, we're trusting in, in faith. We're not in signs. We're trusting him by faith. The Jews need signs. So when, when God sends the 144,000, they're going to be prophesying and they're going to do all kinds of stuff and he's going, they're going to receive him. Now, that pattern goes all through the Bible. When you get into Matthew, in Matthew chapter 12, they said he did this by the power of Beelzebub and the Lord tells the disciples, I'm going to blind them. Uh, let the blind uh, lead the blind. And his disciples are kind of confused. He says, you've been so long with me, you don't really know what I'm saying. But then, after that, he comes to this uh, Seraphonician woman. 
She's a Gentile. She's got a problem. You see, the Jews rejected him, Belzebub. Then he goes into, um, to, uh, uh, he tells the Jews that they're blinded. Then he's, next thing you know, he's with a, Cerne- a Seraphonician woman. Next thing you know, he's getting on, getting on, a, on, a, on a boat. And there's all kinds of turmoil and waves and stuff. That's a, that's a type of the tribulation. The Jews are in the boat, but who's in the boat with them? The Lord Jesus Christ. He gets them through. The Bible is nothing but types. A guy wrote a book back in the 1800s. It, has, it listed over 43,000 types in the Bible, and they're all related to that one, two, three, that same pattern every time. So when you're looking, reading the Bible and you want to learn something, look for the pattern. It shows up time and time again. You know, like Matthew chapter 5. You know, he talks about the, the, the uh, talking about the law in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. I've got to quit rambling. I'm sorry. I, this is a really good lesson. I've kind of butchered it. But when you look at this, when you look at the, the, the uh, uh, I lost my train of thought. What was I talking about? Matthew chapter 5. When he, he's talking about when you turn the other cheek, you have to go to the book of Moses to find out what it's about, the Levitical law. When it talks about slapping someone on the face, turn the other cheek, Back in the law, it wasn't against the law to defend yourself. It was against the law to hurt someone without a cause. And when you slapped someone or knocked a tooth out or poked, uh, poked a guy's eye out or broke an arm or something, you went, to the, you went to the high priest. And they would judge you and judge your punishment. They didn't have prisons back then. If you were, did something worthy of death, they would kill you. If you did something less worthy of death, they would make you compensate. But most of the times, if you slapped someone, they would say, okay, the high priest would put you up there. Bam! They would slap you in the face. Well, the Lord's saying, okay, you're worthy of that. Turn the other cheek and let him have the other cheek also. Take double the punishment. If you, uh, if you stole something, you'd have to give him double. That's what it means. But people don't study the Bible. They don't know what this stuff means, and they think it's, well, I had a, a guy one time was working for me. He says, he says I don't believe in, in uh, killing people. So... I said, well, you're in the wrong business, buddy. I said, you want to repeat that to my boss? He backed off because he knew he'd get fired. Because you had to be willing to to use deadly force. It's not against the law to defend yourself. I recommend that everyone be able to defend yourselves. God doesn't look down on it. God looks down on on cowards. And none of us should be cowards. When you go proclaiming this book, proclaim it. Don't be afraid. There's power in this book. And there's power in his name. And if you're not praying, you're playing. But anyway, thank you, Rick, for telling us. <laughs> I wish. But I had a feeling something was, something was going to happen this morning, so I brought. I just packed my notes up and brought them in case there was some, you know, had someone needed to teach this morning. But we're so close to the end. 
and don't let anyone steal your crown. And if you don't have a crown, go out there and earn one. Tell someone about Jesus Christ. I, I pray this every day. Lord, help me to be watching, waiting, working, and serving till you come. And that's what we all need to be doing. Just be a willing servant. Just ask, Lord, give me someone to talk to today. Because when you get, that, when you get up there and you're standing before an almighty God whose brightness is like the sun and his glory, and you're prostrate on, your, on, on, on the ground on that sea of glass, and you're saying, oh, I wish I'd have done something. I wish I'd have done something. I wish I'd have, and he, he calls you up, and you, you, he says, well, I gave you this. I gave you a, a talent, and everyone's got one. That's your testimony. Use it. If you're willing to use it, God will use you. If you're not willing to use it and you hide it under a basket, God will say, what that man's got, take it away from him and give it to him because he used his talent. He goes into eternity with nothing. Some of us are going to have a few crowns. Some of us are going to have one crown. But we're going to be, be able to take that crown that's given to us and place it at his feet. And you know when the Bible says when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, he's wearing not one crown. He's, he's wearing many crowns. I want one of those crowns to be the one that I took off placed at his feet. That's why it's so important to be faithful and to be looking for his coming because I believe it's going to be real soon. The world's talking about World War III. They're talking about famines. They're talking about pestilence. They're talking about another plague, another lockdown, another this, another that, and taking your money and going to a cashless society. We've been a cashless society for quite a while. But it's, it's all about fear do not be afraid of what's going on in this world. Fear him. Not this world. Don't fear anything that's going on in this world. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, you have absolutely nothing to worry about. And if you, you know, I, I, somebody wrote me the other day and said, well, you know, you might have to suffer. I said, if I'm a martyr... Happy am I. The Bible says if, if you're a martyr, you'll, you'll serve with him. It's all about him. It's not about us. It's about him. Everything's about him. The way we live our lives is about him. And we're to give him glory and honor and praise and nothing else. Just him. I might give my wife praise because she'll slap me in the face if I don't, but, you know. You have to make exceptions. But anyway, let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for one day you're going to come back and take claim of this earth, and you're going to set everything right, and we get to go, we get to be with you forever. Oh, glorious day, Lord. Lord, help us until then. Help us to serve you. Help us to be looking for your coming. Help us to be obedient to your name, to your word, and to nothing else. Blessed be your name, for us in Jesus Christ. Amen.